Our first speaker today is a newspaper giant. He served as editor and publisher of the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin, a senior editor at the Chicago Tribune and the Sun-Times, and editor and general manager of the legendary City News Bureau. He started out as a copy boy. And looking back on his long career, he said that the best advice he ever got was from a crusty old editor at the City News Bureau of Chicago. He told our first speaker, and I quote, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> our first speaker today has edited projects that won the Pulitzer Prize, served as a Pulitzer juror, and is a member of the Chicago Journalism Hall of Fame. Now, he wanted me to tell this one story because I had the privilege of working for Senator Kennedy for 35 years, God rest his soul. And every time Senator Kennedy would come to Chicago, no matter if it was Miggs in the old day or Midway or O'Hare, he always insisted on going down Lakeshore Drive. He could not believe, to him it was like the eighth wonder of the world, that the most political of towns in the world, cities, would have had 17 miles of public lakefront. And so Bernie said, in your comments, please uh, mention that, so I wanted this to do that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Bernie Judge. Bernie, come on up and then sit down here. Our second speaker is an award-winning author, co-author, and or publisher of 16 books about Chicago. He is a Chicago native. Our second speaker has written about Chicago, its neighborhoods, and downtown. The titles include Chicago in the 60s, Neighborhoods Within Neighborhoods, The Old Chicago Neighborhood, Downtown Chicago in Transition, The Rise of the Magnificent Mile, and Sounds of Chicago's Lakefront. His books have won three independent publisher awards in history and several Illinois State Historical Society awards. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Sammers. Neil. All right, Bernie, it's showtime. And uh, with me, it's a computer, anything. All right, with me, it's a computer, almost anything can happen. Uh, but uh, Neil, you want to start? Sit down and relax. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's always someone like in the audience. Uh, yes, yes. But Art will take care of you, so don't worry about that. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, I've learned today that I've worked with a legend. Yes. Of course, he told me that from the time I started working with him, but that's all right. Ber I, Bernie and I... I... I've never doubted for a moment that I've right. imagined that. For... <laughs> Several years ago, I uh, interviewed Bernie for a book on Chicago in the 50s. And it was so much fun, I interviewed him again for Chicago in the 60s. His problem is that he was from South Shore, or a parish in South Shore. And as Neil Hartigan used to say to me, I did not grow up in Rogers Park, I grew up in St. Jerome Parish. Right. I didn't know that. People at Sullivan High School didn't know that, but that's the way it was. So Bernie and I talked for a long time over the years about wouldn't it be fun to work together on a, on a topic. And since I had already used up downtown Chicago and the Magnificent Mile, what was the next logical thing to do was Lakeshore Drive. And when I first thought of Lakeshore Drive, I thought about, you think about all the neighborhoods that feed into the drive. But when we started working on it, we realized there's a lot more to the history of the drive than anyone ever knew. And we could never find any particular source that said, you know, the drive was not built as a continuous roadway. In fact, most people we talked to at different levels said to us, well, wasn't that a continuous road? I, I have no idea where did it begin? So we started looking into the history and luckily we worked with Gary Johnson of the Chicago History Museum who said, I'm gonna give you unlimited access to our photo collection which would have meant a book about 400 pages with the photos we got. So 
What we want to do is talk today about some of the highlights of the story of Lakeshore Drive. There are some historians here who will probably challenge me, disagree, but basically... And if there's any mistakes, it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. I take full responsibility, <laughs> just so you know. So let me just talk a little bit about some of the early issues on Lakeshore Drive, and then, and then Bernie will, get, will jump in with more of the story, because I think it's important for you to know that Lakeshore Drive, if you don't know, Lakeshore Drive was a series of landfills, of sections, built of sections, that really began when, when the city cemetery was filled in and they moved the bodies and it became Lincoln Park. So it goes back to the 1860s and even earlier, and the commissioners from the Illinois-Michigan Canal said, in essence, keep it forever open and free. This is part of the whole thing. In fact, that was used in, in the various suits by uh, Aaron Montgomery Ward years later when he looked out his window on Michigan Avenue and saw this terrible dump in front of him, and he filed suit. So that's why you only have the Art Institute on the east of Michigan Avenue, technically, other than the Millennium Park, because he filed suit and won four different times, I think four different suits that he won, and he irritated so many people in the city, but he protected that lakefront, and in fact, they also wanted to build a field museum in Grant Park. And they argued for a long time and they moved it where it is today. So you had a lot, you can thank Montgomery Ward and he doesn't get that much credit, as much as he deserves, for really protecting the lakefront. But you had a lot of people over the years that helped save the lakefront. And let me just go back one second. When they built Lincoln Park, they also built a roadway in Lincoln Park where they wanted to have people have their buggies and carriage rides in Lincoln Park, started off that way. Then along came a man named Potter Palmer. Potter Palmer had lived on the south side when he moved north in what became the Gold Coast. He wanted to have a roadway in front of his house. And Potter was somewhat influential since he had already bought and built State Street and what became Marshall Fields. And so he had some influence in the city. But he had one problem, and the guy named Captain George Wellington Streeter, who also laid claim to a certain part of this land, and there were battles back and forth in the politics of Chicago. But there's his little, what was known as the castle, the Potter Palmer Castle. And, and all, the, all the stories of Chicago tie together. So if you look at this magnificent castle, it was filled with art. Most of it was French Impressionists, and most of it is in the Art Institute today. So the Art Institute was, is part of the Lakeshore story and the art that's in it that actually made its reputation comes out of that home, that, that magnificent castle, which would have been about, what, 1400 north? Correct. Today. You can also thank uh, Bertha Honoré Palmer for the creation of the Art Institute since they gave their collection of Impressionists to the Art Institute. And again, that's the only building, technically, that was east of Michigan Avenue. One quick thing, I'll turn it to Bernie, is that do you know that Grant Park was created with refuse from the Great Chicago Fire of 1871? It was all pushed into the lake there so that the area between Michigan Avenue and the Illinois Central Railroad tracks was filled in, and there you have the start of the process of filling in, continually filling in the lakefront because they wanted to have this forever open and free. Yeah, like right there. See, that was, that was lakefront, and you can see that the railroad tracks behind it, and that eventually was all filled in, and that's Grand Park, but there was water. At one time, most of it was water. And you can see the fantastically handsome factories in the background there. <laughs> uh, that we, re the city reluctantly got rid of. I mean, what's amazing when you, when you look at these photos is, um, there's Grand Park, at, that's turn of the century, and this, became the Art Institute. Right here. Right there. Yeah. And, uh, but when you look at these pictures is that the, the downtown was pretty, it's very ugly. And as time went on, each decade, the Grant Park and, and the lakefront in general got more and more attractive to the point where it's, it's beautiful. And I, uh, uh, Steve Anderson is here someplace and his wife Sally was talking to me the other day and she said that they they did a tour of, of Lake Michigan. You, know, you can do that around the lake tour. You do the whole. So the, the only place where you could really see Lake Michigan is in Chicago. You know that's 17 miles where you see the lake most of the time. And any, any every place else, it's it's 
covered up by uh, people who, with elegant and not so elegant properties along it. But it's, what I mean, that isn't very attractive. And you can see those are box cars on the Fashion Way. That's all box cars. You know, the only central just. Now you try to put a box car in Grand Park today. You know. Ask well, remember also remember that and you probably know this that the Illinois Central Railway goes back to uh, Senator Douglas, who fought to have that railroad built in and go all the way along the lakefront. And then when, when Chicago didn't have the money for a, for a break, breakwater, the deal with the Illinois Central was the Illinois Central would build a breakwater there in return for being able to build the tracks that would come to the station there. So there was a lot of this whole history of Illinois Central that ties in with the lakefront also. Okay. And on, on the south end, this is, uh, this is Jackson Park after, right after the uh, the um, Columbian, Exposition. Columbian Exposition, 1893. And uh, their idea of a nice beach was to have a bunch of bricks, you know? They must have had tough feet. Um, but over time, they, this, this had moved much further out. There was, all of our lakefront is landfill. I mean, none of it is original that we can find. So all of the drive and all of the parks and all of the, uh, the beaches is landfill which once again shows a city, you know, this, we're this tough, industrial, uh, Midwestern, no-nonsense town that each decade spent a lot of money, and particularly in the Depression, Irma Tranner, who's the president of Friends of the Park, uh, pointed out to us, during our, and, it's, and it's in the book, that they had to pass bond referendums to build the, these parks and to build a drive. Back then, you had to go to the public every time you wanted to raise a couple million dollars for, to build something. Not one was defeated. The people of Chicago supported it because it, they, there's a tremendous, almost paradoxical pride in that lakefront. Uh, you would think that they would want to have a lot of commerce there because that brings jobs and work. But no, they wanted that lakefront to be a place of recreation so that, uh, well, I'm rambling on, but we'll just keep going. <laughs> right. Oh, and by the way, you, we're going to do a, a Q and A in uh, uh, in about ten or fifteen minutes at the very most. And so, please ask us uh, questions that, if I don't know, it's because Neil didn't tell me. Right. It's, it's your turn. Well, here here's the north side. So here is uh, Lincoln Park, and then and the, probably the Lincoln Park West kind of drive that you'd see to, see today. So this is a very it's a very similar, I think this is Stockton Drive right here. Uh, so you start now seeing all this development going north. We, I don't know if we have the picture here, but there's a great picture in the book. I think, is the bridge here? Yeah, I think it'll get there, I think. Okay, no. well, this is back to the south side. Uh, we've seen enough of the bricks. All right. <laughs> this is the Illinois, the industrial, I forgot the name. Art Center? Is no, it, it wasn't an art center. This, this is what became the Art Institute. That's in essence, it was, was an industrial exposition center. It goes back to the, probably the 1870s, 1880s. And that's all Michigan. Now this is, this is happening my favorite, because this is the favorite one on the north side called the Edgewater Beach Hotel. On the water. That's right. At that time, that was on the water. And then the decision was made to expand Lakeshore Drive uh, from Foster, so we could move the traffic up to Hollywood. And it made, no one at the Edgewater Beach Hotel, very happy. Best we can determine, Edgewater Beach Hotel was having financial problems in the 50s, so it was struggling anyway, and then they, I guess they opened up the, the, the extension in 57, 54 to 57, and they built that. But I remember growing up, going on the drive, so for me it meant getting on Sheridan Road and going very slowly over to Foster and going very slowly onto the Lakeshore Drive. But my favorite part of Lakeshore Drive which we can discuss later, was the S-curve. Um, I had a very weak stomach growing up. So my father had a way of driving like this, and we'd get, to, we'd get to the bridge, and the bridge would go up. And there I was sitting, praying that we'd somehow get past there. And I'd tell the story, when I'd get to the south side, in South Shore, my grandmother would always yell down, we have the ice water for Neil. We're all ready for him. So that's how I fondly remember. It was, it was much more fond memories coming back from the south going north, and that's part of this whole story about memories of your vision 
on the drive, what was your favorite view? Those on the south side will argue, and Bernie will argue, that the best vision of view of downtown came if you're coming from the south, past the museum, and you'd see all the lights in downtown. For me, and for others who were on the north side, well, it was, it was coming from the north, coming past Fullerton, getting off at uh, LaSalle, and then you'd see, you'd see downtown. Now, both are magnificent views. But again, none of us ever thought about, gee, I wonder what was the history? Where did this come from? And so you have this beautiful history. That's construction. Isn't that nifty? There's more. This is, this is Fullerton here. Okay. As they, again, this whole process of they would expand the drive section by section and keep on going further north. In the same way the city would annex sections of towns right next to it and keep on in the 1890s, this is the same kind of thing. And this is, um, go ahead. Well, this, this is right, right past the Drake Hotel. Yeah. This is the East Lakeshore Drive. This is part of the land that Captain Streeter said was his, and uh, there was that battle over it. I mean, and those buildings are still there. Yes. Yeah, they're still there. Huh? And a lot more. And a lot more. Right. What's, isn't it the, that, that's the richest block in Chicago, the East Lakeshore Drive. Well, there's a nifty fact See? to know. I'll win a bar bet or two off of that. <laughs> <laughs> here, here is Grant Park once again. See the boxcars? Isn't that pretty? All these people come down and look at boxcars. You know? <laughs> it shows you how... I, I just can't get over how smart they were back then to not let this stay this way. You know? And this is the, the South Shore Country Club which was a very, fa I'm a South Sider, so very, very famous place that uh, naturally I never belonged to. And if they had their way, I wasn't allowed into. You know? but, uh, so we, it's, but it has a wonderful, great history. It, it was originally built by the Armors and the Swifts and all of those folks, you know, and they, uh, the first thing they made sure to do is never allow people like me to become a member of it because <laughs> I'm a parish guy, you know, so they, but, but then finally, uh, my tribe took it over, and the first thing they did is they excluded the Jews from becoming a member. <laughs> Which I think shows you the Chicago way in a nice little condensed uh, piece of action there, don't you? But it was a wonderful club, and it had a little golf course on it, and, and it, it was really quite beautiful, and it, and it still is. And, and that's where Barack Obama had his uh, wedding reception which I think is a marvelous, from the Armors of the Swifts to Barack Obama, that's a nice Chicago history, which I like. I, get, I think that's wonderful. All right. Of course, none of this has a damn thing to do with the book, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's a shot from, from the other major exposition fair that was held along the lake. You had the Columbian Exposition of 1893. You had the Century of Progress in 1933-34. Both of them helped shape the drive, the museums that were built around here, and remembering also that the Museum of Science and Industry was a remnant of the Columbian Exposition. So a lot of the pieces fit together here. There it is. That, that's the, that, that's the S-curve. For those people who wanted to discuss it with me earlier, well, we have an S-curve today. I said, no, we don't have the S-curve today. <laughs> so show them. See, there's Streeterville. Show them. See, there's Streeterville. That's lovely high rises, magnificent buildings. Well, you, can, you can orient from here. Maybe. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right. And, and here's, here's where uh, Kim and I live, right over here, so, right there. In the parking lot. In the parking lot, yeah. <laughs> it's nice, it's a tent, but we're thinking, you know. But look at how amazingly ugly. That's all railroad tracks underneath there, you know. This is, uh, you know, Randolph is right about there. And it, I, once again, here's, here's something that's very, very unattractive. It, this was completed in 1932, right? Yeah. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. No, 37. 37. 37. Frank, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt came here to dedicate it, and they made this S-curve because it runs along the property lines, the Illinois Central and the... And the, the Illinois Chicago Dock and Canal. Chicago Dock and Canal. So they were very helpful, and they said, why don't we make this impossible S-curve, you know, <laughs> so that we don't have to mess with our companies. And uh, so they did that, and eventually it got straightened out in the late 80s, and it became one straight across, you know, and... Uh, as I've said a couple of times, I have two cousins from Beverly who swear they were the first two guys having a beer going across the new one straight Lake Shore Drive, straight across. Now, by the way, just as a matter of fact, it was not called Lake Shore Drive until the 1940s. Right. 
37 was when Roosevelt opened the bridge. He does, dedicated the bridge. I'm, I was told by one of the interviewees that it was sort of a political trade-off for him to come and dedicate the bridge. And I'll, I'll let the rest, when you read the book, you'll see why, what, what, what the deal was. This is the drive at Jackson Park, right? And there's the Museum of Science and Industry exactly. and, and Hyde Park up above of it, above it. And uh, this is a very, very beautiful piece of the drive. Really but you can cool. see here when we talk about landfill, how this was all, uh, up to until that time, up until late, years later when they did all this, these neighborhoods came up right up against a lake. And that, that's what made it fascinating. If you go from the north to the south, it just came right up against a lake, if it was even filled in at all. Here, here's Millennium Park. Oh, so the story we would like to tell about Millennium Park, Dan Walsh, who helped really, he was the builder for Millennium Park, he told us when they, uh, when they were doing the construction there and they dug down, not too far, they noticed a very strong smell of fire because they uncovered the ashes from the Chicago fire that had been used to fill in what became Grant Park and Millennium Park. So it's, and they found a, rail, a railroad car and they dug down further. There are a lot of pieces of history and so the people from the museum used to come over, used to come over and look for old bottles and old things, memorabilia from the Chicago fire because it was all Everything was just pushed in there. Yeah. I mean, that, this was, uh, you know, Grant Park is, the old Grant Park b before Millennium Park was over here, and, and the, where, the, where the Bean is, and where that, the uh, Prisker Pavilion, it was a parking lot. And that, that's 13 years ago. You know, it was a, it was a parking lot. Because we live in that, one of those buildings in the background, and we'd look down on a lovely parking lot. And now we look down on Millennium Park. So the, a constant improvement, it's, it's, it's I, I really, some, the, the mayor's gonna hire me, you know? I, I mean, if, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Paul, that's right. He, you know, he probably will hire me because that's as long as he'd want me in his employ, three weeks, a month, yeah. yeah. Uh, your turn. So, well, here, here, here's one of our favorite views, of, an aerial view taken by uh, Larry Okrent, who gave us a lot, of, a lot of photos from his collection, of stretching from uh, the Gold Coast all the way over to Streeterville. Yeah. And you see the beauty of downtown. And I, before, one of the really great things about the drive, which you don't appreciate, and Blair Kamen, you know, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, critic from the Chicago Tribune who wrote a lovely piece for us, um, he pointed out there's no trucks on the drive. You know, I mean, you can have a panel truck, but there's no trucks, and that makes the drive much more pleasurable. I mean, nothing against trucks, but, you know, they, they're big, and they get in the way of everything. <laughs> there. Where are we? B Buckingham Fountain Buckingham here. Fountain. Yeah. Again, this whole view of seeing how it all got filled in from one end to the other. Right. Now, we have a piece in there. Uh, Bob Gordon, architect, wants to build a bridge across from the Buckingham Fountain over to the water, but it would be a land bridge. And it'd be really, and it's really pretty so that, because now, as he says in the book, and what, you know, people still, there's no light there. There used to be a light there. But now people will come, they'll leave Buckingham, and then they'll just try to run through traffic and, you know, to, just, it's horrible. Because <laughs> you know? traffic moves pretty fast there, and that's eight, la eight lanes. Otherwise, they got to walk a block in either direction to get across. And so it'd be nice if you had a land bridge, which would be landscaped, like the roofs in some of the new buildings. You know, they're green. And, and Gordon, Robert Gordon has, a, has a, a plan to do that. And it's in the book, and it's quite nice. So there is, there is uh, Millennium Park and downtown and a great, great view. There's a field museum. You, begin, you see the, feel the uh, museum campus here. So again, this whole vision of what, what they did with downtown. And of course, downtown was not too attractive at, at certain points. And so this, all this work that's down there, I think, has really made it very, very popular for the people coming to Chicago. This is one of Bernie's favorite shots. Yes. I haven't figured out why exactly, but he... Two he, reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the drive is right there, and, and this is the point where, as, you, as you're coming up, going north on the drive, this is about 50th Street, 51st Street Beach, back here a little bit. That's the first time that all of a sudden you see downtown. The trees break and you see downtown, and it's just, it's just electrifying to me. And you know, you're seeing it over a, 
azure lake, as I like to say. Of course, think about the lake, it's a different color every day. It's never the same color twice. And, and it's first time you see the downtown, you see the power of, this, of that loop. I mean, that's a powerful bunch of buildings. And you're going into it, you know, trying to make your mark. And then there's also, if you live. I was going to show you. Yeah, then there's, here's my Alfred Hitchcock moment. That's me. See, hiding behind a tree. That's the power of being a co-author. <laughs> I, I couldn't help. We're going to change the name of the book to Find Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> so here, here is the north end. Here's, here's Hollywood and, and the north end of the drive. We're going to have these various shots of the drive. Now this is, this is uh, the end of the, uh, the developer. McCaffrey. McCaffrey. I never remember Irish names. Um, <laughs> he... He, he has, and he's already, most of South, that extension that says South Lakeshore Drive, most of that has been constructed uh, already. But he, this is U.S. Steel. This is the South Works of U.S. Steel. Yeah, this, is where, this is where I worked before I became that copy boy at the City News Bureau. It was my last uh, civilian job before I got in journalism. Um, and you'd go into 89th Street Gate, you go into 89th Street Gate, and there was 30,000 people going to work in that, in that, that area. Three, three shifts a day, seven days a week, nonstop, always going. And I grew up a little bit over to the west of there. And uh, we would, I always said we liked pollution because when we saw the smoke coming out of the mills, we knew everybody was working. And if there was no smoke coming out, that meant people weren't working and that was bad. You know, So that was one aspect of pollution I was very comfortable with. But this, this is going to be really beautiful. And at the back of our book, the back cover, there's a picture taken from just away from the extension of Lakeshore Drive, which shows all of downtown. Because this is 3,500 east. 35, this is like Pulaski is west. This is, this is 3,500 east. And the, look at that view of downtown. It is absolutely amazing. So he's got this plan to do this, and I hope he succeeds. He's getting a lot of support. And that will take these South Works, which are now nothing. It's, they've cleaned it up. The U.S. Steel went in and completely cleaned it up, took about six or eight feet of soil out, got rid of all of that uh, corruption and the pollution and the toxins. And it's ready to go. It needs an infrastructure and just a billion or two dollars. <laughs> Should we now take questions? Pardon me? Oh, that, it, it uh, it begins at 79th and it ends at 89th because then you come into Calumet Park up here a little bit and then you got more park and then you're out of, you're into Indiana shortly thereafter. So that's part of the last four miles. This is the two miles south and the two miles north that aren't, that are in Chicago that aren't the people's, you know. They don't have a lot of access. You do have Rainbow Beach in the south side, but uh, I would love to see this happen and I, you know, this recession can't last forever, so I think it'll happen. And he's, he's a pretty smart guy. Let me just mention about the last two miles north, which yeah. is a, a somewhat of a controversial issue. That is the extension of Hollywood further north. There was talk about it for years, there's still talk about it, and the question is, how, from, how much further north? Um, Evanston? Well, Met? Can you imagine anybody so far that I've named who's going to be excited about the drive going out past them and getting off, and all the traffic will be able to get off in their neighborhoods? Small thing. Uh, so as, as uh, U.S. Representative Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky said to me, if she attempts to move one stone in her area, that's the end of it, her career right there, that the people, the people in Edgewater who own the condos, the people in Rogers Park who want the beaches, and they say no way. Whether it happens or not, I don't know, but it was, it's really the question about where you take the traffic and what do you do with it when you get it off the drive, if you were to extend it. And who, you, who, who are you making life easier for, people in the northern suburbs so they don't have to go on the Edens? It's, these are the kind of questions that are still there, and plus the cost of doing that. And so it's, ever since the, the Hollywood thing was, was finished, that's still been the issue about what to do next, if anything. Now, uh, I think if you would like... Uh, Catherine, do we have any questions for these fellows that have not been answered? The old professor showing incredible restraint. Uh, and while she's walking around, you should know that 
her family was the owners of the Edgewater Beach Hotel. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, there's this. Ginny, we don't talk about that side of it. Just a bit <laughs> first. This is all a bunch of players in here, and we don't want to... We don't want to, we want to do it. By the way, because I am, if you heard me this morning, the white line down the middle of the road, right? We got to introduce uh, Billy Hood from American Airlines. There's Billy Hood right over there. There we go. All right. Questions for the, uh, for Bud and, Bud and Lou. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, while you're thinking there's of a, a question. question. There's a question right there. Yes. When oh, were the when, industrial right. buildings knocked down? If you've got to write out these questions, but if you want to yell it out, this is a city club. We have no rules. Sort of like running for mayor. Go ahead. Uh, almost all of them are gone by the 20th century. By the 20th century. All right. Now, they didn't ask me to be part of this book. That's why it's going to sell. Uh, <laughs> but one of the reasons that Chicago had such a growth of parks is that there were three park boards. The Lincoln Park Board, the West Side Board, and the South Park Board. And the South Park Board was very political. And rumor has it that there was ways in which you can make a lot of money coming from the South Park Board. The head of it was a guy who never would go into politics. I think his last name was Kelly. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons they kept building. And where are the judges? They leave? Uh, the South Park Board was selected by judges. <laughs> Kirk, just think, just, just think of what that means as far as, shall we say, having the ability to build things like Soldier Field. Uh, and we'll go on. Okay, a question before I get in trouble. Isn't he good? Huh? <laughs> Joy Saxon, you did not, this is him, to him, right to me, right? You did not discuss the trouble of... Straightening the curve, yes, the S curve. The S -curve. And, and again, it was a very, very political situation that went on for quite a while because part, part of it was the, where was located uh, the Illinois Central Railroad, the, old, the Chicago Dock and Canal, and then trying to get that straightened out, and then politically building it, moving it. I guess someone said at our table that that goes back to you can thank uh, Jim Thompson because it really ha happened under his administration that they finally, they finally, remember, but part of that was tied in there, remember, was the extension of Wacker Drive. So, but you could straighten the curve, and then you could also have extension of Wacker Drive, upper and lower, so that you can move traffic that way. So again, if you remember, even turning off at Randolph in the old days, how that all got straightened out and made life easier. I would just quickly say, I had a Volkswagen, my first car, the 66 Volkswagen, didn't like the S-curve. And once in a while, I'd start making the turn, and it would just die right there. And then I'd have to start up and ship very quickly, so. Another question. I, I, we have written questions. Hey, I'm in charge here. <laughs> Just because you went to Sullivan, don't try and push it. Don't. It I know you guys are pushy. What was it, Navalis City? The Navalis? That's right, the Navalis. That's yeah, right. I, I understand that. Got it. Very creative we were. A question anonymous. That's okay. We, we accept it for, this, for today. <laughs> Has Lakeshore Drive been copied by any other city, or are there similar roadways around the country or the world? There's a... Yeah, Milwaukee has a... Uh, a, a lakeshore road. It's not a, a major thoroughfare, but it's quite nice, and it goes about uh, it goes about two miles, maybe three at the most. Thanks, Catherine. So I, I, that's the only one. The only one, I, I can't find anybody. And, and you know, one of the men in our book, uh, Phil Enquist, who is an urban planner for Skidmore and a brilliant, brilliant man, brilliant. And I wanted to get his. He's been all over the world. He knows everybody. He's been everywhere. And, and I, he thought about it a real long time, and he basically said uh, there is no place comparable in the world that he knows of. So well, last week when Mark Brown did the article about us in the book, he said we would be justified if we wanted to call it the world's most beautiful roadway. Right. I mean, it was enough. I went with Bernie's idea. My, I, I, I named it Chicago's Lakeshore Drive, and then he went from there. Yeah. And I thought I'd be modest and just say America's greatest urban roadway. Okay, we have a question here from Mademoiselle Judith Turk, just flown in from Paris. What is happening with Children's Museum protecting the lakefront? Well, I, I, I can. Yes, you can. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> I'm not touching Children's it. Children's Museum is, uh, 
they started out being a grub above ground and basically they would have never gotten had it built that way and so they put it underground you know so bring your children to a ditch and uh, <laughs> uh, let them see all of Chicago's basement um, now you can tell where I feel about it you know, I guess I won't get that job with the mayor for three months. Um, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't have a shot anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, but they brought it down, and it's actually, it's only about 15 feet above ground, and the rest of it is underground. But there's no money for it, and uh, the, the Tribune had a marvelous editorial on the front page of the Sunday paper. I'm uh, not on the front, I mean on the editorial page. That's assuming you could find the editorial page in the Sunday Tribune. Um, and in which they said that you should, that you should, uh, this should never happen. They should go back to Navy Pier. Navy Pier really wants them, and it's a great place. I bet you half the people in here have brought their children to Navy Pier, to the Children's Museum. It's a marvelous location. And all they have to do is renegotiate a lease and give them another 10,000 square feet, which they could do easily because they have all the room in the world at the pier for them, all the room in the world. And I think that's where they will end up, and I don't think it will ever be built in Grand Park. If they try to, they'll be in court, and those four previous U.S. and Illinois Supreme Court decisions, I'll have to face them, which is forever free, clear, with no obstructions. And uh, I don't see it ever being built in, in Grand Park. Well, there's one word commentary on that that I, some people might raise, but I certainly wouldn't. But I think that last name is Pritzker. Yeah, I'm, just throw that out for just ponder that one. Okay, <laughs> yes. last question, because I know you all want to go and buy those books. I certainly do, even though I'm not wasn't asked to participate. Uh, from Paul, <laughs> Do, uh, Paul, what's your last name? Dorsick. Dorsick. Okay, sir. <laughs> what a great way to end this. This is this is perfect, uh -huh. especially especially for me. Any comment on the spire, the Calatrava building, Cal Calatrava building? Yes. Oh no, I, I would say I think it's a beautiful hole. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Maybe they could put the Children's Museum in the <laughs> hole they got. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Well, on that, on that note, on that note, gentlemen, we each have a love for both of you.